And welcome back. In the authentication phase of AAA, we have some fantastic technical options for validating who the user is. One of those options is, of course, to use a password. Now, passwords, however, can be problematic because if an attacker learns or steals a password, the attacker could use that password to impersonate the user. Also, suppose we have a password that is used with plain text protocols, including HTTP, FTP, or other protocols such as Password Authentication Protocol, or PAP, which we can use on the back end. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. In those cases where we're using a password with plain text protocols, that password could be compromised just by somebody eavesdropping or sniffing the network. So here's an example of that. Imagine we have Bob here. And Bob is at his computer, which is connected to this port on the switch. And let's imagine also that we're doing 802.1x uh, in this environment, which basically means we want to make Bob prove who he is and who the computer is before we just give them full access to the network. So as part of the 802.1x process, Bob's computer would have some software like an agent running that provides the credentials of Bob. This switch, is, which has been configured to request that information, is going to use the backend services of a server. So right here we have the authentication server, which would be an example of a centralized authentication server. And that way, switch one and switch two and the access point and all the other devices can use this centralized authentication server for verifying the credentials of Bob. And here's one of the problems. If we're using an insecure protocol between switch two, for example, and the authentication server, an example of that is PAP, <laughs> password authentication protocol, clear text. So if Bob's password is, you know, ABC123, and he supplies that, and then the switch sends that over to the authentication server, and it uses PAP. Unfortunately, that's clear text, and somebody who's eavesdropping on that conversation could then see Bob's password and harvest that information. So if you're using like an LDAP server, a backend server for authentication that supported PAP, that would be a significant weakness in our infrastructure because that traffic with an LDAP server using PAP is not gonna be protected. Now, there's also options for accessing LDAP uh, which are secure and not secure. So we would have to almost try to make this an insecure solution by using PAP, password authentication protocol, which is clear text, and using unsecured LDAP. So if we had both of those weaknesses in our environment, we're basically asking for an attack or a compromise of our passwords. So the solution is use options other than PAP to talk to the LDAP server. And then with LDAP, we can use secure protocols for encryption of that traffic back and forth as well. Now, hopefully we're not going to be using a lot of plain text protocols that could be compromised by somebody eavesdropping on the network. However, one solution to improve our authentication is to require something other than just a password. We could require, for example, a password along with something else. And a question might be, well, Keith, uh, what exactly is this something else that Bob is going to supply along with his password? And the answer to that could be some flavor of a one-time password, also called an OTP. These types of one-time passwords are usually good for a very short period of time. And then once used, those passwords are not used again. See, that way, if an attacker or hacker eavesdrops or discovers a one-time password that the user supplied, and then later the attacker tries that same one-time password, it's no longer valid, so they can eavesdrop all they want. Now, one of the challenges, however, in using one-time passwords is how do we get these one-time passwords into the hands of our users? <laughs> and one standard option is a token generator. A token generator, also think of it like a one-time password generator. It can be a hardware device, or it can be an app on a computer or a smartphone. In either case, it generates a little teeny code, the one-time password, that the user can then use on demand. And the password is gonna be generated or rotated over time, making it a one-time password. And so here I just did a quick search for OTP one-time password, password generator, and it has some examples. Here's a piece of hardware that generates a one-time password. There's another piece of hardware that does it. And we have some software solutions too, like applications that run our smart devices. And here's an application that would run on a PC. And the goal is to generate a one-time password for the user to go ahead and input that along with their traditional password. And that way we can verify it really is Bob or the intended user and not just some attacker who wouldn't have access to the one-time password. Now, there's a few different options regarding on the back end how these one-time passwords operate. One option is a time-based one-time password, also called a TOTP for time-based one-time password. So for that, we could use a, a physical device that generates the token or the code. 
or we could use an application as we looked at a moment ago on a computer or a mobile device that creates that code. And if it's a physical device, that could often be called a hardware token generator. We could also refer to that little device that generates the token for us, a physical token, something that the user has that generates the code that they'll need to go ahead and authenticate. And typical authentication applications that can generate a one-time password include Google Authenticator, uh, LastPass Authenticator, Authy, and more. And with time-based one-time passwords, the code or token that's generated on that token generator is then provided to the user. And then when the user logs in, they look at their little, either the application or the hardware token, and the user provides this token or code as part of their login. And then on the back end, the server verifies the one-time password that the user supplied. So time-based one-time passwords are available within a very small time window based on a one-time password system in use. So the app or hardware token that's generating the code will show the user how much time is left within a time window to supply the provided code. So imagine we open up the application. It says, oh, you've got 15 seconds left, 14 seconds. We just wait, <laughs> and then we'll wait for it to generate a new code, and then we'll put it in, and that'll give us enough time once we put in the code for the backend system to verify it. Now, most of the time, those generators, whether it's software or hardware, is going to have some type of authentication or a PIN required that the user has put in to access the one-time password generator. Now, another option, and again, this is behind the scenes because the user may not even know or care how this works, but another option instead of using time-based one-time passwords is use a HMAC one-time password or HOTP. So if our one-time password system is using HMACs, which stands for hashed message authentication code, it implies that we're using some hashing and we're also using some secret, such as the key for the calculation. So with an HMAC-based OTP, which could be called a HOTP, the one-time password, theoretically, it could be valid for a longer window of time because it uses hashing and the key for the secret instead of just being valid for like 60 to 90 seconds. In either case, on the back end, it'll be the back end server who's going to be validating that the one-time password that was supplied by the user is, at the moment, is being used, considered to be okay and authenticated. So both methods for one-time passwords, hash-based and time-based, are both considered very secure methods for adding that level of authentication to verify that Bob, or whoever the user is, really is who they say they are. And let's use this example once again with Bob here. And for Bob's authentication, we're requiring to use a password for Bob and also a one-time password. So he gets out his little key fob or software application that generates the code. He puts in his username. He puts in his normal password. He also supplies the one-time password. And then on the back end on the server, when it gets that information, it can actually refer to an external server for the one-time password, which can verify whether or not Bob's one-time password he supplied is correct, or it could be an additional service that's running on the same physical hardware. But in any case, it's doing the additional check on the back end to verify that Bob is who he says he is by checking his password and also verifying the current one-time password that Bob put in. And with the time-based one-time password, Bob's one-time password is only valid for 60 seconds. So if an attacker gets it, he won't be able to use it in the future. And if it's a hash-based one-time password, that password that Bob supplied and authenticated with won't be the same password for the next authentication. It's going to rotate. So the hacker, whether they steal a time-based one-time password or a hash-based one-time password, and because the attacker doesn't have the one-time password generator that Bob does, that's going to help keep Bob's authentication secure and that we really can believe it's really Bob. Now, having token generators that generate this code for the user is fantastic, but another option for verifying who the user is by providing them a one-time code is to use, instead of a hardware or software token generator, deliver the code, the one-time password that they need, via a text message or SMS. So SMS stands for short message service, and most people just call this a text on their smartphone. So that's yet another way to deliver a one-time password, even though not quite as secure as using a token generator, either software or hardware, but yet another method to help validate the user is who they say they are by texting them a code that they can use for that login. Now, another method to consider when we're validating a user would be an automated phone call. So if the user is logging in, the user can confirm their username and password, and then an automated phone call could go to the phone that they own, and then they could, with their voice or with the keypad, continue the authentication and or permit that authentication to happen. Now, if somebody gets locked out of their account, it's also pretty darn important and essential, I'd say, to provide some backup mechanism for them to get back in. And the more self-serve options we have for our users, the less it's going to cost to maintain and support our authentication system. 
So one of the options as a backup for our users is to give them or provide the ability for them to create a static code. And the static code can then allow the user to reset their password or recover their account when they need to. So in cryptocurrency, we have things like hardware wallets and software wallets and paper wallets. Those are all typical. And most of those options include static codes for the ability to restore those wallets in case of emergency. We want similar functionality for users to recover and get access back in. And having backup codes is one of those options. Another great option we have for authentication is push notifications. With a push notification, when the user attempts to log in, a message is going to be pushed to their mobile device. And then they'll have to respond to go ahead and continue with the login. Now, a significant benefit of push notifications is that if our account is being attempted to be logged into by an unauthorized person or individual, we can, with the push notification, we can decline and reject that login attempt based on that push notification that comes to our mobile device. And that way, just from the push notification, we can actually specify that, no, don't let that person log in, which is really, really handy. Not only does it let us decline the login, but it also is a, you know, a wake up call that, hey, somebody else is trying to log in to this account. Another excellent resource that we can use as part of the authentication is a smart card. Now, what makes a smart card so smart? Well, it's got a, a chip in it and other intelligence built into it. And as a result, our systems can identify us and confirm what we're authorized to do based on having a reader that's looking at that chip. So smart cards can also be used for logging when people are going into or out of a building or other secure areas. So smart cards can be a big part of multi-factor authentication, which we will cover more in a video coming up in just a few minutes. Now, one of the challenges that we may face in organizations is how do we authenticate a user like Bob and give him multiple rights across the enterprise and not force Bob to re-log in every time he accesses another resource like a printer or a file system and so forth. One solution to simplify the administration and the access is the concept of SSO, which stands for single sign-on. If we have a system that supports single sign-on, like Microsoft Active Directory, that means that Bob the user can authenticate one time when he logs on. Then in the background, the entire system and all the resources that Bob or the user has access to will be provided or given to him without re-authenticating every step of the way. And again, one example of this is Microsoft Active Directory or called AD and its directory services. So the Active Directory would have the user log in one time and effectively when that user logs in, they're logging into the entire domain and the entire domain and all of its resources that Bob's entitled to, Bob can have access to without having to re-log in. Now, one little snag with single sign-on. Suppose there's multiple organizations and you know, organization A and organization B and they want to share resources between them, between the users, and they want to make it easy for users in one organization to access the resources in both. In that case, they could use the concept of federations. This is where organizations directory services from company A trust the authentication performed in the second organization, like organization B or whatever directory service they're using, and provides the user access without forcing them to log in a second time. So according to Webster's dictionary, this uses the concept of attestation, which is a declaration that something exists or something is the case. So in the case of federations, we could have one domain or one organization's act directory services and the other organization's active directory services effectively trust each other so that authentications that happen here can be communicated to the second domain and the second domain can say, okay, I believe it. I know that this is a valid user and automatically give them the rights without having them log in again. So in the case of federations, it's the single sign-on in one system which validates or verifies a user's authentication, like for example, domain A, for the benefit of that same user being trusted over in domain B. So in this video, we've taken a look at some techniques and methods that we can use to better authenticate an individual. And one other aspect that we really didn't touch on in this video was biometrics, which is helping to further verify and authenticate a user when they're connecting or accessing a network or a system. So in the next video, you and I get to focus on biometrics as part of authentication. It's gonna be a blast. I'll see you there in just a moment. Meanwhile, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.